Morning, everyone. This is Shreikali Bagh from the European Bureau of Aviation and Defense Universe based out of Cyprus. Today, we have with us Mr. Jitendra Bharkar, former executive director of Air India, who is also the author of the book, The Descent of Air India. He is here to discuss the pros and cons of the sale of Air India to Tatas. What is there in the government of India? What is there in it for the government of India? Is it a wise decision to take over a financial sagging airline for Tatas? Will Air India get a job of life under the new owner? Where will this take the Indian aviation? There are so many questions to which we will try to find the answers today. I would now like to request Editor Sangeeta Saxena, ADU, to please steer the discussion ahead from here. Welcome, sir. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, Atali. Good morning, sir, and welcome to ADU's chat room. This was morning. wonderful to have you here. Actually, the truth is, sir, when things happen, it's always perfect to understand it from the horse's mouth. And no better guest than you today, sir. So we have your introduction from Chatali, and now we will begin with our question number one, sir. Is this sale going to redraw the landscape for the aviation industry? And if so, sir, how? You know, if you go back into the history of Indian civil aviation, JRD Tata had given Indian aviation a head start in 1932. 1948, Air India operated its first flight to, Europe, to London. And that was the time when none of the carriers who are currently dominating the Indian skies were non-existent. So instead of India dominating the Asian skies, Indian skies, etc., it was the, the reverse. And this was largely because the government of India and its wisdom in 1953 nationalized the industry. So what are we going to look at now is that once Air India is put back on the growth trajectory under Tata's, because funds will not be a constraint, Tata's are known for running the Taj group of hotels. They are familiar with the hospitality. They had run Air India very successfully in the past. And Air India begins, becomes a dominating player in the Indian market. So two things would happen. One, Air India's reach worldwide will grow in a big way. Second, what unfortunately happened when Air India was not growing, the Gulf carriers, the Southeast Asian carriers began dominating the Indian market, taking away India originating traffic. A lot of Indian diaspora in, a bro in the United States, Europe, started patronizing the Gulf carriers and the Southeast Asian carriers to come to India. So what was the weakness of Air India because other Indian carriers, unfortunately so, haven't looked beyond the Gulf and the Southeast Asian for operating flights. Indigo has 50% plus market share in the domestic market, but does not fly to Europe, United States, Japan, Australia, etc. So there was a big vacuum which was filled in by the Gulf carriers and the Southeast Asian carriers. Now, I am very sanguine about it, that once Air India is under the control of Tata's, it will not only be a quantitative growth, it will be a qualitative growth. So a lot of people who are currently not patronizing Air India will patronize it. The market share will go up. Indian carriers will go up. And one salient point that we generally overlook is that when we created this vacuum in India for the other Asian and Gulf carriers to dominate, we lost out big way. It was not just that Air India lost out. It was also that the jobs were being created abroad. The revenues were being created abroad. The fleet expansion was taking place of these airlines. So India as a whole suffered. So one underlying positive gain of the government decision to disinvest and Tata's acquiring it is that India civil aviation landscape will change and change for the better. Wonderful, sir. That was so well explained. And when we continue from here, you know, when, whenever there is a negative story on Air India, it emanates for the, from the HR policies. Now, uh, and I'm talking of the past. So do you think with data is coming in, HR will become better, Air India will be more employee friendly. How do you expect this change to happen? 
You see, let us not forget that Air India basically grew up, I'm talking of largely the erstwhile Air India, the international player, in the monopoly era, where there was little competition in the market. So the work culture, one, was government. A lot of government policies influenced it. Unions had a major sway on the management. The work practices were certainly not productive or efficient, and we had to continue with it. So unfortunate part is that it took a huge toll and there was no realization that we are losing out when the competition began in a big way in the 1990s. The service suffered, and once you get into the thing of losing money, you start cutting costs, et cetera, and passenger amenities suffer. So it's a bad, bad way. But my contention, having been Director HR of Air India also is that it is wrong to presume that all of Air India's employees are unproductive and inefficient. The main reason why the delivery is not up to the mark is primarily because they're not having inspiring leaders. Every department, whether it's engineering, whether it's the ground handling, you need to have a departmental head who can inspire the rank and file because they're all educated, they're all trained. So it's only a question of getting the best out of them. So this is where it suffers. And then you don't have the, you know, what happens in government setup is that everybody gets promoted on the basis of length of service. Whether you have the aptitude, attitude, competence, merit doesn't matter really, it's the length of service. So when a person has risen to the level of a departmental head, he has just risen on the length, on the basis of length of service. So he is not an inspiring leader. Now come to Air India under the Tatas. You will have a professional management. You will have people who have accountability and they will inspire the rank and file. And once they inspire, and mind you, they will have to re-engineer work practices. And people right. will be open to change in work practices and they will deliver. And my contention is that the government stipulating that the jobs are assured for one year post the disinvestment could be a positive for the employees because in this one year, they will give their best so that they also enter the second, third, fourth, fifth year in the Air India under Tatars. Very true. But this is a gain for the Air India, definitely. Then what is it in it for Tata's to have taken over a debt ridden airline? You know, you don't expect Tata's to have just put in their financial bed and got Air India. They have done a proper due diligence. Leave the emotional connector aside because JRD Tata had founded it and Ratan Tata is also very emotional about it. So the fact remains that there is a lot going for the Tatas as far as Air India is concerned. Let us not forget that Air India is India's dominant international player. There is no second who comes very close to it also. Air India is the only one which has a network spreading towards United States, Europe, Australia, Japan, you tame it, and Air India flags. So you have a basic foundation for the Tatas to improve upon it. You do not get pilots for the love of money. 2,000 experienced pilots are available. So you have a large chunk of the network going. And please remember that when you start a flight to a new destination, there's a lot of cost involved. Slots, new offices to be opened. Here, everything is available. So Tata's have to build on this foundation that Air India is providing. By no chance, I'm saying that everything is hunky-dory the task will be formidable. But to say that it is sheer emotional connect that made Tata's bid for Air India would be a wrong proposition. Because you have to have everything going and all that is required is bring about a qualitative change, which I'm very sanguine Tata's are capable of. That's wonderful. So actually when you explained, I realized that yes, there's something which is already available in plenty. So it's easier to build on a strong foundation. You know? I think that is your point, which is very nice, actually. And uh, as a journalist, sir, when I used to be covering, I mean, I've been covering now for very long, I had one section in Air India I found was very strong. The employees' union. 
Now, these how will these unions now, you know, how are they going to form a bridge between the buyer and the bot? Because their role is really important, you know, for keeping both the sites stable. So how do you think they're going to play this role? See, let me divide this question into three parts. One is the phase when Air India was in the monopoly era. Unions were calling for strikes as and when they felt it on very, very fictitious grounds, inconveniencing passengers. Then came the second competitive era, where unions became responsible and they were not going on strike even if there was an issue involved with the management. They would threaten a strike, all right, but they never embarked on a strike. They knew it, the consequences would be disastrous for them, not just for the airline. And now come to the third phase under Tata's. They will behave very responsibly, considering one, the government stipulation that you are job security is for one year. Number two, there is no kind of other way available but to change work practices. Unions may have dictated certain work practices which were unproductive and good from the employee's perspective, but not from the airline perspective. They will have to readily agree for changes because you can't go through another phase of saying, look, Tata has acquired, they put in money, but we are still a hurdle. I have in my book made a mention of karma. I said, look, when you delayed passengers who were going for job interviews to attend funerals, to attend weddings, etc. I'm sure they would have cursed. So if Air India has gone through a bad patch, could also be partially attributed to the curses that the passengers who suffered at the hands of the unions because of these frequent strikes, they've suffered and they are no longer enjoying the kind of life, the emoluments, the perquisites, et cetera, which perhaps me or the earlier generation of people who work for Air India had. Sir, uh, you know, Tata's is not new to the business. So they already have a very ready Vistara, very active Vistara across the boundaries. And they have the Air Asia India. Now, do you uh, envisage a merger between the three and one big airline coming out of it? When Air, See, the third being I, don't, I don't think I would be the right person to speak. But all I can say is that the Tata management has professionals. While doing the due diligence and deciding to bid for Air India, they would have taken into consideration all these aspects. But logic demands that, yes, you cannot have multiple airlines operating on the same routes. You will have to amalgamate, consolidate. Like you can't have Vistara operating to London as also Air India operating to London. You're going to be competing with British Airways and other carriers not with airlines coming from the same stable. So their things will change, and I'm sure they would have had a definite plan on it. Uh, so then I think another thing which I wanted to understand was Alliance Air is not a part of this team. Now, Alliance Air is not a part of this team, is it? So now uh, the tier two cities, the tier three cities, the smaller regional, you know, after Quran, you've got these regional hubs where you are connecting from the very, very small towns also. So how does that fit in? Because then I think that's going to be a loss to Tata's, isn't it? Look, you must realize one thing, that when governments after the 2017-18 fiasco, as far as the disinvestment process was concerned, <laughs> they did a thorough study of it. One change was that we will disinvest 100% equity and not 76% as in 2017 18. You cannot be handling an acquiring airline with something that they may not need. Alliance Air operates to tier two, tier three cities with smaller aircraft. Why must you get some airline to say that, look, take this airline also and operate services when they're not interested in? So government of India has definite plans because we all know the Uran scheme that the government of India has. They want to operate to smaller centers. So you can't say, look, we will take a political decision to operate between these two cities because the government has an ambitious plan of utilizing underserved cities, underserved airports, etc. Now they can't look at it. Either the government says, look, whenever we ask you to operate a flight, 
from point A to point B, which may be economically unviable, we will introduce the viability gap funding process. But if you are not going to do it, don't saddle it. So in my opinion, it's a sound decision on the part of the government of India. You have kept Alliance Air away while disinvesting Air India and Air India Express. Thank you, sir. And uh, uh, beyond this, sir, there's a very, very big technical manpower which you have under your uh, biggest MRO in the country of imports, and uh, that is AI, uh, AIESL. Now, what happens when that is left behind? And it, what is the job work it, ha it has now? You know, so it has actually the complete. It seems very uh, funny that you have the whole airlines going away and the MRO staying back, or could be a bright decision on the government that you come and get your MRO done from us. You know, one thing is this talk about surplus manpower and all is an outdated thing. When Air India had a very small fleet of 17, 18 aircraft with about 15,000 employees, and that was the time when we, one, we were saying that you have so many hundred employees per aircraft. But now with more than 140 aircraft in the, in the fleet and Air India having adopted the modern system of management of saying, look, the airport staff will be under the separate category. Ground handling staff will be under separate category. Engineering staff will be under separate category. Now we count the manpower. And then you say, look, we conform to international standards. So this myth needs to be exploded, busted. Now come to the point of the engineering services. Air India has a large engineering services. And because Air India is of, a, of an era of 75 years old airline, right? And that was a time when every airline had everything being done in-house. So they created their own engineering services. But modern airlines, which have come up in the last 20 years, have not created engineering services. These are outsourced activities. Was it is prohibitively costly to, if you follow with the airline and you have the engineering services, or you have an engineering service which says, I shall not only undertake maintenance of Air India aircraft, but also go for third party airlines. Then it makes economic sense. So it's again, a good decision on the part of the government to have kept it aside. And if you want to disinvest, disinvest as an engineering services and get more money out of it. Because Tata's possibly, or any other airline spice jet chairman, they would not have liked to have engineering being bundled along with the airlines. No, I just want the airline and I can always outsource the engineering services activities like they do currently. Okay, oh, that's also an idea actually. Uh, Sir, you know, uh, your uh, Tata has a great reputation. Now Tata has also a great fan following in the country. So the day when we were traveling uh, on 8th, I was, when this thing was happening, I was in the Air India lounge in the at T3 in Delhi, traveling to Mumbai. And there was excitement. I mean, I, I, I could actually feel that excitement when the announcement happened and we were sitting in the lounge and somebody just said, oh, it's got disinvested huh? and the sale is final. Now, does it mean, you know, that positive energy which Tata gets and the reputation, the product Air India, how will that change? You know, I've often stated that if Air India was not as good an airline as it ought to have been, it was also not as bad an airline as it was made out to be. This was because of the Sarkari ownership, the kind of controversy Air India got in very often, and it got highlighted in the media, whereas private airlines were excused. They were not dealt with the same kind of benchmarks as Air India was. So once Air India comes under the fold of Tata's, which is a very welcome thing. In fact, I had advocated as early as 2013 in an interview to CNBC TV 18, that instead of giving permission to start Vistara, that was when the application was mooted to start a full service legacy carrier Tata and Singapore Airlines, I said, return Air India to the Tata's. The emphasis is on the word return, don't sell. You acquired something which was exceedingly good. You have messed up the airline. 
give it back to them and they will create. So first thing that's going to change is the perception of people. Because Tata's have, are the winning entity for Air India and the disinvestment process, the criticism has been muted. Employees have welcomed it. People in the industry have welcomed it. For the simple reason that JRD Tata had a humane approach while running a commercial entity like Air India to glorious heights in that area. So everybody is looking forward to, can we get back that period when Air India commanded universal respect, though being a very small airline as compared to Pan Am, TWA, Qantas, BOAC of that era, you know? Great. And uh, so how do you think it's going to affect the working and the work culture? How do you expect that to change with the change Look, in ownership? It is going to be a formidable task. As I said, Tata's will have to take drastic decisions. And sooner they take, the better. Because some element of people will be averse to changes. They've been in their comfort zone for far too long. Now, unless they've taken out of the comfort zone and said, look, we are going to be looking for the comfort zone of the airline, not your comfort zone. So then you find the changes coming in. And I'm sure while doing the due diligence and the time that has elapsed since the process of disinvestment was initiated, Tatas would have looked at all these points. And I can easily say, well, if you don't need anybody's help, just read my book and you'll have everything in it. Right. So uh, how do you expect the court sharing to change in uh, international groups? Uh, you know, Code sharing is a small thing. Let me put it in this way. What Tata's are getting is Air India as a Star Alliance member. Star Alliance is the biggest alliance of airlines. Yes. So you only have to may ensure, because in my opinion, personal opinion, Air India was not capitalizing or taking advantage of the Star Alliance membership. Tata's will, they will know that look, considering the fact you pay an annual fee to the SAR Alliance for being a member, there is no reason why you should not synchronize your operation with the SAR Alliance members, enhance reach, give passengers better amenities. Because at airports where you do not have your own lounge, SAR Alliance airlines have, you're entitled to use them. You're also entitled to take use, make use of technology. And coming to the technology part, we all know, Tata's have TCS. And if TCS has been providing services to airlines, there is no reason why TCS will not give the best of technology to Air India. And that's been, a, incidentally, a weak point with the Sarkari Air India. Now, whether you are trying to make use of your frequent flyer points or doing online booking, et cetera, all this will dramatically change under the Tata's. I think it should be taken as given. It's not a challenge for Tata's they will provide it and they know the basics of running an aviation business. Absolutely. And also that Air India's ASKM and you know, these things are damn good. They're very good, actually. So I think that should also be an asset to... Uh, you Tata's. see, it is... No, yeah. It is not true just for the machines, the aircraft. Hmm. It is also true for the men. The yeah. low productivity element. And once you raise the bar, you get surplus capacity. So you don't need it. Like I've said on one occasion, that when Tata's began, began to expand the fleet, they will not have to hire pilots or cabin crew because they will be able to optimize utilization of the existing staff. And that is where the gain will come. In. So Tata's will find it. Say, for example, the load factor of Air India flights domestically ranges between 80s, spice jet is in the 90s. So if you can raise it this 10%, so what are you getting? It goes straight to your bottom line. And I've argued one thing very clearly, that people have to realize that India is a difficult market to be for airlines to be profiting. We are a price sensitive market. Most airlines are losing money barring Indigo. So first phase data should be aspiring to is to reduce dramatically the quantum of losses. 
and which should not be very difficult because of the wasteful expenditure, the unproductive use of machines and men, you know, take for example, out of the 140 odd aircraft that Air India has, for 2025 aircraft are on ground because the spare parts are not available because you haven't paid the vendors for spare parts they are on ground. So no private commercial airline would like to see an aircraft on ground because an aircraft makes money only when it's up in the air. So all these things, whether it's the machine and the men, the potential is available. You have to harness that potential. And I see no reason why the professional CEO of the Tata-led Air India would not endeavor. Absolutely. And sir, another uh, thing which I think, you know, uh, might have a little influence, all the aircraft are not home. So there's some leased, there's a, a huge lease market and everybody also has these things. Now what happens to these aircraft? The lease let's gets look transferred at and... No, let's look at this way. There are aircraft which are owned by Air India. There are aircraft which are under the sale and lease back arrangement which means that you have sold and taken back on lease and you can't get away with it, right? All that Tata would need is, and in fact, Tata would need far more number of aircraft, let me put it this way, that you have to optimize utilization. You have to ensure that every aircraft is flying. You have to ensure that the aircraft interiors, which haven't been attended to by the Air India under this government control for, because of paucity of funds, they will have to invest money. And once they've invested money, the passengers, one of course will come because it is no longer a government airline. Perception change that I was talking about. The second is the qualitative change that will come about. But the major qualitative change will perhaps take a year or two because aircraft interiors will have to be done up for which startups will have to invest considerable sum of money. So when you look at the kind of lag available in the Air India system, and you improve upon it through efficiency, we'll find the gains coming to you faster. And I'm sure Tata would have done this basic exercise and said, look, this is what my first three month plan would be, first six month plan or first annual plan, and I'll go about it. Yes, Because, yeah, sure. Jair, because Ratan Tata's tweet had one positive element. He says, JRD Tata would have been very happy Wherever he is, he'll be happy when he knew that Air India is coming. So clearly indicating that the dream is to give Air India the kind of image it enjoyed, it enjoyed in the past. So there is a mission and they will go, go ahead and achieve it. So I'm all for it. Thank you very much, sir. I mean, it was so wonderful speaking with you and getting to know these things, which actually you cannot, you know, you need somebody who's lived in the system, understood the system to get to the audience to know what is actually happening. But sir, we cannot close the interview without having a look at the book and talking about the book you've written, a book which has been popular, a book which also was in a little bit of controversy, if I might say so. And uh, eventually, you know, people, when they read it, I read it, and it's, uh, it's fun reading it, you know, let me put it that way. So you know, uh, let sir, me, why do you just show it to our audience? Let me explain to you. I started my career as a journalist. So I had a tendency to read between the lines. And I've been one kind of a different kind of an employee who believes your loyalty is to the company, not to the management because managements keep changing, the company is, stick, is the right. permanent entity. Right. So my loyalty has been to the organization. And it is not just that I post-retirement, I penned the book. Even during the course of my service, I was writing letters to the management that this is right, this is wrong, this is not needs to be done. For example, let me give it to you, and you had put that question earlier, I could have answered then also. Air India has been signing agreements with the unions, wage agreements. What has unfortunately been happening is that while management honors the clauses that are relevant to the employees, employees do not honor the commitment that they give to the management in view of that. So I was always upset as to why are we making Air India sink? Why are we not stemming the rot? What is wrong? 
So there were certain things where I said, look, I wrote a letter to the chairman, Raghu Menon in 2009. I said, look, perform or perish was the title. I said, look at it, whether a soft approach will do or a hard approach will do. How can a company prosper when everybody goes home at five o'clock, even under challenging times? You have to look at whether the current team of management is capable of delivering, because many of them have risen to their current levels by default, through seniority, through promotions and all that kind of a thing, undeserved promotions, et cetera. So things had to change. So when I retired and I was very popular on the social circuit in Mumbai and people used to ask me, what's happening to your Air India? I thought I owed an answer to everybody who'd been patronizing Air India in the past and who's interested in knowing. So it took me a considerable time in deciding whether I should write the book or not write the book. There were friends and acquaintances and family members who said, don't write, you'll get into trouble. Then there were people who said, write the book, people need to be held accountable. People have a right to know. So if your journalism, journalist thing comes out of you and said, look, I'm going to tell people what really happened. So since I was in a dilemma whether to write or not, I retreated to Rishikesh, to an ashram. Stayed there for nine days, though my booking was for 15 days, whether to write a book or not write a book. And ultimately a decision taken, I must write the book. I came and started writing the book. The Descent of Air India was the title of yes, the book. Sir. Yes, sir. wonderful. So, you know, Actually a very nice book. So when I wrote this book, the controversy came in because I did not fear it was written without fear or favor, let me explain to you, whether it was my friends or anybody, but anybody who harmed Air India got featured in it. And unfortunate part was that a minister felt that the book was on him, when in the first half of the book, he does not even get featured. So I was talking about systemic weaknesses. So a lot of people felt, look, it's a political book when it wasn't, but book has been doing exceedingly well. It's on Amazon available. So I'm very happy about it, that look, the book will be sold, book people have a right to know, and it become a reference thing. One university in South has it as part of the curriculum. So, you know, I have been writing. So being a journalist, so you brought it out, the facts as to why it happened. And mind you, it was not just what was wrong. The remedial action was also given that this is what you need to do. Take for example, when government of India talks about the huge losses of Air India. So that's a fact which has been highlighted where the assets have not been highlighted to that extent. I said, let Air India produce two balance sheets because we are uncertain whether it's a social airline or a commercial airline. So for all the tasks that it performs under the social domain because the government said so, and the cost platform becomes heavier because you're following government policies. Because I, one thing that I've kept saying is the people at the senior management get much less than the counterpart in private airlines, but people at the junior level get much more than the counterparts in the private airlines. So there are various things that I've put it out. And I said, if you have two balance sheets, employees one would know. Because as of today, what do the employees in union believe? that Air India has been messed up entirely by the government policies. So when I wrote the book, I said, look, everybody is responsible, including employees, including unions, including senior management. You simply can't say, look, I'm not responsible. So when the book was written and it got on in public domain, everybody said, well, you're echoing my views. People who are very, very you know, loyal to the organization, they were of this opinion. But people who were at the receiving end naturally did not endear me and said, look, Mr. Bhargav has written a book, but I don't agree to it. But vast majority, and after retirement, everybody agrees, agrees to it. So I'm very happy <laughs> that I did this and put the legacy of Air India, what led to it. And that is why, you know, when I said, and it's an insider's view, that people who were supposed to make it so let it down. That was the unfortunate part, and I still can't reconcile to it. The only thing, I've been the strongest, staunchest advocate of disinvestment for over two decades. So when I was being interviewed on television on the day Tata's were announced at the wedding party, I said, you are speaking to a delighted Jitendra Bharat. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Wonderful to have you on the show. It's I'm sure the audience will just love these 40 minutes. Thank you so much, sir. And whenever there's something new on the Air India front, we'll get back to you always for Thank the you. lovely insights you give to us. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank you. It was very absorbing hearing to you. And um, I will I will just hope that in near future, very uh, easily, I think Tata will be able to do it to expand the network in Middle East. No, the people have already started asking me, Mr. Bhargav, will you write another book, The Ascent of Air India? You should. <laughs> you should. You should. Absolutely. Right. Okay, Thank you so bye. much again, sir. Okay, right. Bye-bye. Thanks Thank for you. your time. Bye, bye sir. Bye.